So we've been in a series called Our King and His Passion since the beginning of July, actually since before I got here, but we've been looking at the last week in the life of Jesus. So the word passion means to suffer, and we're looking at the suffering Jesus took when he took the cup and as he's headed towards the cross. So today, we're going to look at the crucifixion. So the new guy gets to preach the cross. No pressure, right? So how did we get to the cross? In the beginning of Matthew, we see two things that are foretold about Jesus. Number one, he's going to be Emmanuel. He's going to be God with us, God in the flesh. But number two, the angel of the Lord tells Joseph before Jesus is born that he shall be called Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Why does Jesus have to come to save his people from their sins? sins. There's a clear need. Apart from Christ, we are, we are totally sinful, and we cannot do anything to be made right with God. We are enemies of God. We live as enemies of God, and apart from the work of Christ, we will be treated as enemies of God. So, Jesus came to save his people from their sins. But how? Often, our most important truths become very familiar realities to us. And so the most important things in our life become commonplace. The very first time that I told my wife, Whitney, that I liked her, like, liked her, liked her, it was a big undertaking. I had friends who orchestrated the hangout at Taco Bell and the ride Whitney had to Taco Bell, just happened to have to go back to campus early when we were in college. And so I said, hey, well, I'll take you back and I'd love for us to go on a walk. So we go on a walk and I'm like, this is the moment. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, be strong, and I'm just going to look in her eyes, I'm going to tell her. So I took a deep breath, and about three and a half hours later, I finally told her that I liked her, <laughs> and now we've been married nine years. And so eventually, those I like yous became I love yous, and I love you has been used to express our deepest love for one another, but it's also been used to end arguments, if I'm being honest, and it's the way we get off the phone. Like, I love you. Bye. Like, that's what you do. And so our most important realities can become very familiar to us, and we can lose the weight and gravity and the importance of those realities. For most of us, you did not come to church this morning surprised to hear about a crucified Savior. The cross does not shock you. We have the cross on coffee mugs and t-shirts and jewelry, and none of that is wrong, but things that are the most important to us eventually become commonplace. So this morning, as we dive into the passage and we dive into the crucifixion of our Savior, I want us to feel the weight of our sin. I want to, us to feel the weight of the crucifixion, but even more so, I want us to see the beauty and the miracle of the cross. So our big idea this morning is Jesus was not saved from the cross so that we could be saved by the cross. Jesus was not saved from the cross so that we could be saved by the cross. We're going to begin in verse 32 of chapter 27. Matthew 27, 32. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there, and over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. If he trusts in God, let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Pray with me. Heavenly Father God, you are abundantly good. Lord, as we look at the miracle of your crucifixion, the fact that you would come and die for sinners, those who do not deserve any of your goodness. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around. But Lord, this morning I pray that your beauty and your love will shine through on the backdrop of our sin. Lord, you're so good. Speak to us this morning through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So our first point this morning is Jesus was not saved from the cross. The passage begins, and it says, as they went out. So Jesus, he's been beaten, he's been mocked, he's been stripped naked, they put a crown of thorns on him, they flogged him, he was scourged, they beat him with a whip that had pieces of metal and bone, and he's bloody, and he's been humiliated. And they're going to make an example out of him. The Roman government, the Jewish people, they want to make an example out of him. They want everyone to know, do not try to be king. If you claim to be king, this is what's going to happen to you. A lot of you traveled over this Thanksgiving week, Thanksgiving holidays, right? You probably figured out pretty quickly, speed limit signs or suggestions around here. But what is more effective, blue lights or a speed limit sign? Well, if you come over the top of a hill and you see blue lights, all of a sudden, like you're going 20 under the speed limit sign instead of 20 over. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's because of the threat of punishment. So what they're doing with Jesus, they're going to hang him on a Roman cross to intimidate anyone and everyone who could even think about claiming to be king. They want to put an end to the life and ministry of Jesus, and they're going to make sure that they do that through his suffering. They want him to suffer. So he's led out to his crucifixion, and they get a man named Simon to carry his cross. Why? Because Jesus is at this point probably too weak to carry his cross without dying. They cast lots for his clothes to humiliate him. He's been mocked, he is stripped naked, and he is suffering. And no one stops them. No one stops them. The perfect Son of God, Jesus, they're doing this to Him, and no one stops Him. He is innocent. He's done nothing wrong, and no one stops Him. Oftentimes, we'll think, if I would have been there, I would have done something differently, right? We could look through moments in history where people were treated unfairly. We could watch a movie and go, hey, if I was that character, I would have acted this way. And when we look at the cross, we, I want to scream out, no, like someone stopped them. But if we were there, we wouldn't have stopped them. In our sin, we would have been in the crowd cheering on the death of our Savior. Because of our sin, we would have been with the crowd. We would have been against Jesus. The most unfair incident in the history of history is happening, and nobody stops it. Verse 35 very simply begins with this phrase, and when they had crucified him. I want to say that again. And when they had crucified him. The Bible does not detail the horrific accounts of what crucifixion was. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they don't go into all the gory details of the horrific process of crucifixion. The reason for that is pretty simple. If I was going to write a biography about your life, I probably wouldn't devote a whole chapter to cars 
or iPhones or Christmas lights, but most of you drove here in a car, you had an iPhone with you or a smartphone, and there's Christmas lights, right? We would just be a detail. It would not be a whole chapter. And so the crucifixion was commonplace to them like, like things are commonplace to us. But for our purposes this morning, we need to know a little bit about crucifixion. So crucifixion was the process of execution where a human being was attached to a wooden T-shaped structure, either through being tied to it or nailed to it, their arms apart, their feet together. Before this, they were stripped naked, they were beaten, they were scourged, so their flesh was bloody and ripped, and the whole purpose of this is for them to suffer. Sometimes people spent days on the cross before they died. Most victims of crucifixion died from a heart attack, loss of blood, or they ran out of strength to push themselves up, and they suffocated within themselves. And they did this to Jesus. The crucifixion is very hard to stomach. The reality that our Savior, the Son of God, died on the cross is hard to stomach, but it shouldn't be difficult because of the brutality of his death. It should be difficult because of the reason for his death, which is the sin of of his people, our sin. Our sin put Jesus on the cross. I have a friend who likes to use the phrase, it's best not to dwell on it. So something minor could happen, he'd get a speeding ticket or pay a bill late, um, or something major could happen. He'll say it's best not to dwell on it, right? I've been with him and he's stepped in a puddle and he's not sure what it is and he'll just say, best not to dwell on it, right? Let's just put it out of our minds. And when it comes to the crucifixion, we can try not to dwell on it. We want to skip over it and get to the resurrection, but it's best to dwell on it because it shows the love our Savior has for sinners. We want to not dwell on it because if the cross is not as bad as it actually was, then that means our sin is not as bad as we think it is. Our sin is horrific. It is the reason Jesus is on the cross. We can look at the people who are crucifying Jesus and say someone should stop them. But we are them. Jesus is not on the cross because of anything that he did. He is perfectly innocent. He is on the cross because of the sins of his people. Jesus committed no sin, but because of his people, because the sins of his people, he is suffering, he is bearing the wrath of God for sin. It very simply says, the guards, it says, then they sat down and kept watch over him there. So they sit down. So their guards, they have a front row, court side, 50-yard line seat to the crucifixion. So what's going on here? The guards had three purposes. One, to make sure the victim died by crucifixion. So they actually died. Number two, for them to suffer as much as humanly possible. And three, to make sure no one rescued anyone from the cross. So there are accounts of men in this time who were crucified, who at some point while they're on the cross, they were taken down from the cross and nursed back to health, and they actually lived. So the guards, they're there to make sure that doesn't happen. And friends, that does not happen this day. Jesus would not come off the cross alive. The crowd turns and they begin to mock Jesus. They're mocking him. There's an Old Testament word, um, scorned. I think it's a better, better word than mocked. It means to treat something as worthless or despicable. They're shouting insults at Jesus. They're mocking him for who he claimed to be and what he claimed to be able to do. Right? If you grew up with siblings or you have close friends, you're used to this, right? My brothers, I have two younger brothers, if I said I could jump so high or run so fast or beat a level on a video game, it didn't matter what it was, they had two words for me. Prove it. Prove it. If you say you can do it, do it. And so here's what they start to do. They start to mock him for who he claimed to be and what he claimed to do. If you're the son of God, come off the cross. If you can rebuild the temple in three days, come off the cross. If God really wants to save you, he will come off the cross. And they're mocking him because they don't think he's going to come off the cross. They're saying, you are so foolish to think you're the son of God. If you can rebuild the temple in three days, come off the cross. And friends, Jesus could have come off the cross. He could have, but he would not. He stayed on the cross. Why? Because he came to save his people from their sins. 
He stayed on the cross to pay the full penalty of their sins. While Jesus is on the cross, the crowd is actively mocking him. They are sinning against him. Some of the same people who we see in the book of Acts, they turn and believe in Jesus. They're they're actively sinning against Jesus. Jesus is paying for their sins in real time. And he stays on the cross. Romans says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus stays on the cross. Why? Because he loves his people and he came to save them from their sins. The Jewish leaders mock Jesus in a very specific way. Look at verse 43. It says, He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. So they begin to mock him. This is a reference to Psalm 22 where David speaks of his enemies, and his enemies are saying if God wants to save him, if God actually cares about him, he'll save him. And that's what they say to Jesus. If God cares about you, he will save you. He will take you off of the cross. But friends, the Son of God came not to be saved, but to save. The passage says from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. So from about noon to 3 p.m., I know we're all still getting used to daylight savings time. But it does, and it gets dark at a weirdly early time, and it's a whole weird thing, and I'm getting old because it's messed my sleep all up. But it doesn't get dark at noon. So why is it dark? The darkness reveals God's judgment. God is displeased with the sin of the people, and his displeasure is revealed in the darkness. In the Old Testament, there's multiple instances of the sky turning dark because God is angry over sin. So why is God displeased? He is displeased with sin. God is not displeased with his son. What did he say about his son at Jesus' baptism? This is my son with whom I am well pleased. So why is he displeased? He's displeased with the sin of the people. But I want you to see the picture. There's darkness over all the land. The judgment of God covers everyone who is there. But who is receiving the judgment of God in the place of the people? God is pouring out the punishment for sin on Jesus. The innocent man takes the punishment of the guilty and the guilty go free. The innocent man receives the wrath of God for sin that we deserve. God does not save Jesus from the cross. So they mock him. If he wants you, if he desires you, he'll save you. But Jesus does not come off the cross. He cries out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? 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 Why is a great question. Why is this happening? Jesus knows why it's happening. He came to save his people from their sins. This is not a surprise to him. He knew in the garden when he, said, when he took the cup, he knew that he was going to suffer for the sins of the people. He knew. He knew. So why is he crying out? Why? Because he feels abandoned by God and he feels the separation that sin causes between us and God and he feels the unbearable pain of being separated from the Father. And he cries out, God, why would you do this? Because the suffering that Jesus takes for our sin is unimaginable. But he stays on the cross. When we fail to see the weight of our sin, we fail to see the beauty and the love of our Savior. We fail to see what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We fail to see that he was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. He was forsaken so that we would never be so they turn and they, the, the crowd, they say, some of the bystanders says, this man is calling Elijah. And they run and they grab a sponge and they put some wine on it and they try to keep Jesus alive. And if, you're, if you've been following along, you're like, that, that kind of seems weird, right? Why are they, what, what's this Elijah thing? What's going on? So there was a tradition um, among Jewish people at this time that Elijah would be sent by God to rescue righteous men in times of need. So what they're saying is maybe God is going to save him. Maybe Elijah is coming. But was Elijah going to save Jesus from the cross? No. No, no one would come to save Jesus from the cross. Jesus yielded up his spirit. He died. He gave it up. 
We sing a song and it says, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. And in one sense, that's true. Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of his people. But the only thing that held Jesus on the cross, it wasn't the nails, it wasn't the the crowd keeping him there, it wasn't the guards, it was Jesus himself. Jesus was not saved from the cross so that we could be saved by the cross. So number two, we are saved by the cross. Our ability to relate to God has been forever changed through Jesus' death. Jesus was on the cross for a capital offense. They've accused him of claiming to be king, which he is king, by the way, and for claiming to destroy the temple, which he never actually did. But what he did say is, if you destroy the temple, I'll raise it up in three days. So what is that about? They accuse him of treason, right? There's words we don't say in airports, right? Because you know what that means, right? There are words you don't say because you don't want to commit treason. You don't want to be seen as an enemy. And so they twisted Jesus' words to make him be seen as an enemy, But what is he talking about? The temple will be raised up in three days. So the temple was the primary place where God's people and God's presence collided. God's people met God's presence in the temple. But there's a true and better temple in Jesus. The place where Emmanuel, God with us, God's people and God's presence meet in Christ. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the place where God's people and God's presence collide. Jesus has been put to death. He is still hanging on the cross when the curtain is torn. Dead. Jesus has been put to death. The place where God's people and God's presence meet, our our eternal mediator, the go-between between God and man, died. Why? To save his people from their sins. The curtain was torn in two. The curtain was torn in two. It was a curtain in the temple that separated God's people and other people from God's presence. Only those who were sacrificially clean and those who um, were pure according to the Old Testament law were accepted. But at the death of Jesus, it was torn in two. At the death of Jesus, the way to be in God's presence was paved. It was made. It was, there was no longer any need to meet God in the temple because Jesus came to die so that we could come to God. First Timothy says, There is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Because of the cross, we can come to God. But even more than that, we belong in the presence of God. So there's a hard part to the passage. If you were following along this morning, you were like, I, I've heard all of this. But Jesus died and people rose from the dead. What is going on here? Um, So if you will look with me at verse 52, it says, The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went to the holy city and appeared to many. So what's happening here? Bible scholars have a lot of things to say about this passage. They have a lot of things to say in general, but they have a lot of things to say about this passage. Some scholars think that Matthew got really excited and just wrote this in the wrong place. Some people think that this doesn't belong in the book of Matthew. I think they're terribly wrong. So what is going on here? Did these people rise from the dead? They were resurrected and they waited three days till Jesus was resurrected to go into the city. So they were just, you know, they were dead. Now they're in these, they're raised to life and they're just like, I guess I'll wait until I get to go into the city. So what, what is going on here? Um, when we come to passages that are difficult, we look at the details, but we don't miss the big picture for the details. So because of Jesus, people have access to God. And because we have access to God through Christ, we have eternal life. So what's happening here? The resurrection of the Old Testament saints, the resurrection of these saints in this passage, connect the work of Jesus on the cross to the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb three days later. They did destroy the temple. They killed the Son of God. But three days later, Jesus victoriously rose again. He rose again as he defeated death and he defeated sin and all who place their faith in him will rise again with Jesus one day. The resurrection of our dead Savior who was once dead and is alive forevermore, points to the resurrection of all who are dead in their sin. But if we trust in Christ, we will be alive with him forever. 
The supernatural events of the cross point to our eternal reality. So because of the cross, how we relate to God is forever changed. So after the earthquake, I just want to point this out. Jesus is still hanging on the cross. He's dead. And there's these soldiers, the ones who tortured Jesus, the ones who made sure he died. They're physically closest to him, but they're as far away from God as possible. But something happens in the crucifixion, and all of a sudden, what does the centurion proclaim? Truly, this was the Son of God. Why? Jesus came to save his people from their sins. And so what happens? The centurion, he sees what happens on the cross. He sees the events of the cross, and he proclaims faith in Christ. No matter how far away you are from Jesus, no matter how far away you think you are from God, you can come to Christ because of what he's done on the cross. Our sin kept Jesus on the cross, but the crucified Savior, Jesus on the cross, keeps our sin off of us. So what do we do? No one saves Jesus from the cross, but you, me, we can all be saved by the cross. So the soldiers, the ones who swore allegiance to one of the greatest earthly powers of all time, the Roman Empire and the Roman government, in a moment, their allegiance is changed. They belong to one kingdom, and now they belong to another kingdom. And friends, Jesus can overcome any earthly power and any obstacle to salvation. The gospel is more powerful, and you can fill in the rest of the sentence. It is more powerful than anything you can come up with. We take our sin to the cross because Jesus fully and finally paid for our sin. He paid the penalty that was owed to us so that we could be eternally alive in him. We could be saved from our sins. We don't deal with our sin by trying to handle it ourselves. We deal with our sin by running to the cross and trusting in Christ. So friends, do not try to deal with your sin on your own. We can become paralyzed by sin and shame, even those of us who are believers, and we can think, I I need to just do a little more and God will love me. Jesus died to save his people from their sins. And if you trust in him, you're saved. There is no obstacle that God cannot overcome for salvation. Anyone who is alive can be forgiven through the cross. If you're like me and you spent time this last week around lost relatives, or you have lost friends who you're concerned about, You think there's just no way they're going to ever believe. The gospel is more powerful. And God is mighty to save. He has made the way for people to come to him and he invites you to come. There is no sin that stands in the way of the cross. Through him we can all be forgiven. If the men who tortured the Son of God can turn and proclaim Jesus as Savior, anyone can. You can be saved by Jesus. Jesus was not saved by the cross. He's not saved from the cross so that we could be saved by the cross. He suffered so that we could be spared. He was treated as worthless so we could be treated as worthy. He was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. And you can trust him. Heavenly Father God, we love you. Lord, thank you for the truth of the cross. In you, we have eternal life, and through you, and through your death, we can know you, and we belong in your presence. We belong to you. Lord, for those who are here this morning who are feeling the weight of their sin, I pray that they will see the shining light of your grace and your mercy towards us. Lord, your love is bigger than our sin, and what you did on the cross is more powerful than anything we can do to reject you. So, Lord, I pray that you will help us all to trust in you. Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for you shed your blood and you shed grace and mercy for us. Lord, I pray that you will remind us and draw us close to you and bring us into your presence, Lord. You are so good. Lord, we love you and we thank you for everything that you've given us. Pray all these things in your name. Amen.